All right, so thank you all for coming to our VCAP webinar series. Today we're going to be talking about troubleshooting CPU performance problems. And it will be taught by myself, Sean MacArthur, and David Sellens. And there's our email addresses up there. And here's some of our certifications that Dave and myself have. We're both uh, VCPs, we're both VCAP certified, and we also hold some Microsoft, and I, I used to hold Cisco. Dave is kind of a SQL guru, and I specialize in exchange. So between the two of us, we can do some damage. We focus on doing a lot of consulting, uh, various different projects from Active Directory and Exchange migrations, which is a big thing I do. Dave does a lot of SQL performance tuning. Uh, we I've done migrations for some of the biggest companies out there in the world. We do performance analysis for companies. I've done implementations of... Uh, V fog light for companies and just analysis of what's going wrong and trying to troubleshoot why they're having bad performance issues. And then we've done a lot of DR implementations for companies. So replication using products like NetApp and RecoverPoint from EMC, uh, use the actual vSphere replication on, on a project. So Equalogic, all kinds of different storage and DR and, and cool stuff using SRM from VMware. So got a little bit of experience on this stuff here. So today we're going to hit pretty hard in virtual machine performance problems. And one of the things you're going to notice here in the next couple of series where we're talking about CPU and memory is that we're assuming that the student has a basic knowledge of CPU and memory. So we're not going to hit a lot of the real basic things. Uh, we're going to kind of skip more to the advanced stuff. And if you need more basic information, we'll get to that at a different time. Now, when we look at potential things that can cause problems that we've seen out there, and we'll go into some of these way in, in more depth, probably the, the first and, and biggest problem we see out there is people building their VMs too big. And you got a VM that's like a domain controller that's really you know not doing anything running DHCP and DNS and, and domain controller stuff, and they're giving that guy four virtual CPUs. And, and when you monitor it, it's using... 100 or 200 megahertz of CPU time. So it's really not doing too much. And building virtual machines that are too big can kill you. And we're actually going to, Dave's going to show you some samples of a multiple virtual CPU VM and show you the potential problems with that using ESX Top and some other tools. Um, Hyper threading, not that this is going to be a problem, but if your host has hyper threading, you'll definitely want to turn it on and just understand that if you've got an eight core CPU, it has the potential to run 16 threads on it. If you have two applications vying for a single CPU and they're very CPU intensive applications, the VM kernel is not going to schedule both of them simultaneously on that CPU. It's going to register just one VM at a time on there. CPU scheduling, which is a process of the VM kernel, and we'll look at how that works a little bit. Resource pools configured incorrectly can really kill your CPU. And what it comes down to is the next thing, the next bullet point here, which is reservations, limits, and shares, which a lot of people use resource pools incorrectly. They use them as an organizational object, and that's not what they're meant for. Um, again, configuring your VMs too big to where they'll cross a NUMA node which uh, became important with vSphere 5. Um, just your host or your VM not having enough physical CPU resources. Now that could be because you built your VMs too big, uh, which is a, a potential problem, or just you're, you don't have enough host CPU resources. Uh, maybe too many VMs on a host, which relates back to the number of the bullet point before it. So you just might need more hosts or bigger hosts and CPU affinity, which you're not typically going to set in a typical VMware scenario. And what CPU affinity is, is you're going to actually go to a VM and you're going to tell that VM run on this specific core on this specific processor. Now, the, the nice thing about doing that is it's locked to that one core so the VM kernel doesn't have to figure out where it needs to go. The problem is it's locked to that one core, so you're limited with things like vMotion and uh, 
you know, if you go turn your latency sensitivity to high through the web client, it will lock it to a core. So we've got some limiting things there, but those are some potential problems you'll see with CPUs. When we look at the CPU scheduler, to perform a task, like with memory, we always try and run that memory on physical memory. But if that physical memory is not available, we'll use all kinds of different mechanisms like swap and the paging file and windows and all this other stuff. Well, with the CPU, we can only run virtual CPU stuff on physical CPUs. So whenever a virtual machine says, hey, I need to process something, whatever it might be, it goes to the VM kernel. And it's the responsibility of the VM kernel to schedule that VM to use a physical CPU or more than one physical CPU if it's a multi-CPU VM. It enforces the proportional share algorithm for CPU usage. So it uses, we'll talk about co-scheduling here in a little bit, but it uses co-scheduling so it actually has to get the proper algorithm in there for the CPU usage. It looks at things like shares, reservations, and limits. Now, by default, reservations are not set and limits are not set. Shares are typically, they're set to normal value and you're just, it's a democratic process where you're fighting for the CPUs among all of the other VMs. So we can increase the reservations, lower the limits, increase the shares or lower the shares to give priority to certain VMs. Think of shares like quality of service, where if you have a limited amount of resources, not everything could get through, so we want to prioritize the things that do get through. And that's where you're looking at shares. You must ensure that the virtual CPU from the same VM does not fall too far out of sync or applications could potentially error and crash. So with a multiple virtual CPU VM, you'll schedule all of your CPUs to run at the same time, but they don't have to be at the exact same area. One CPU could go faster than another one, one might go another, but the responsibility of the VM kernel will halt those CPUs to slow it down if it gets too far ahead and actually try and keep them within a certain SKU. You can run uh, SMP virtual machines and I believe with vSphere 6, Dave correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe with vSphere 6 you can have uh, with Enterprise Plus up to 100 and 128 virtual CPUs in a single VM. And I think with uh, 5.5, that was 64. So a lot of virtual CPUs. It uses relaxed co-scheduling, and it is NUMA aware. And we'll talk about those things here in a little bit. Now, when we look at this here, this is a pretty complicated concept, a world. So when we look at my Windows box right here, we go into Task Manager, we'll see that we have this process that's running and we're running some sort of application like PowerPoint right now. And we see that that's using a thread. Well, when you go into a VMware world and we look at ESX top, you'll see these worlds. And like it says here, a world is in the execution context scheduled on a processor. So it's similar to a process of your conventional Windows operating system. So you have your threads and then you have your actual processes that are running Windows. This is similar to that process and they're the worlds. We can go in and we can see the actual worlds that are running within ESX Top and it's an important concept. Dave's gonna go in there and show you. He's gonna hit C to show CPU resources then he'll show you the worlds running within there and he'll actually be able to expand it and get some cool information from that. So a single virtual machine is a collection or a group of worlds. Just like if I go to my Windows box, I'm running numerous processes, even though I'm only running one Windows box. So if I look on VMware, we're gonna have one machine that's made up of a whole bunch of worlds. And if we've got multiple virtual machines running on an ESX host, we'll have all kinds of different worlds or processes running. So one for here, they show the virtual machine's mouse, keyboard, screen, one for the monitor, all kinds of stuff. The CPU schedule, scheduler will choose which world to schedule on a process. So again, it's working with the VM, with the VM kernel, and with the physical CPU to get all of these scheduled. Now, Dave, I'm gonna actually turn this over to you and let's look at what I was talking about here with ESX Top and the worlds and the CPU and some of the things you'll see through ESX Top. 
So I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to you and make you presenter. Sure. And I can share my desktop and let everybody see. All right, there you go. Yeah. You should have it. I'll mute my mic. And, uh, let me see here. Is that the one? Yeah, that's the one I want to share. Here I've got an ESX top session up. I'm going to go ahead and quit out. It just uh, I'm puttied into one of the hosts, and I'm going to run ESX top. No arguments on it at all, so it's very easy to load it up. Note that the fourth column over is NWLD, number of worlds, okay? So each VM is made up of anywhere from six to uh, or more worlds. Of course, part of that is number of disk controllers, number of, uh, of processors that that VM is made up of. Notice I've got 106 for the system here, and I've got 161 helpers, so there's a lot of overhead processes running out here as well. So here's 12 drivers that are running and some other providers and, and so forth that are, that are running here. So a capital V is a very handy. It gets rid of all the extraneous stuff and just gets it's the virtual machines. Now, note here I've got a, got a couple. Here's VM136-6 has nine worlds, and this one has four. Now, uh, as it happens, uh, let's see. Uh, Six. That's uh, 136.4. Let me go over here to uh, the V center that that is. Here's 136.4 has one proc. Fine. Uh, the dash six one has one proc also. But interestingly enough, in our top session, there's quite a bit of difference in worlds. So let's go in and take a look here at what's going on. So. First of all, I'm going to, I can just hit an E to expand or, or an L to limit. So let's start with limit. Whoops, I hit an N, not an L. <laughs> you can change the, the length of the name field here with an L. And I can drop that down to about 15 characters, make that a little shorter. And uh, all right, so as I say, I was going to do a L. To limit it, I need the GID, that's this column. So let's grab the one that has the most here. And I'm just going to right click on it. It'll immediately copy that once I've, I've marked it here up to the top so I don't have to type it. And bingo, I've got just that one VM. E to expand it will expand out those worlds for me so that I can see all the worlds. So again, it needs the GID. So I'm going to scrape it across there and look like it doubled up on me. So let's get back down. It uh, stuttered. OK, so here's my worlds. Now, notice I've got ones for the virtual CPU. If I have more than one processor on my VM, I will have more than one vCPU. I'll be CPU 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, et cetera. As, as you said, you can have like 128 uh, processors there. Um, so the, you could have 128 threads for all those processors, OK? So, all right, the V threads are the disk controllers. This particular VM has four disk controllers. Now, I'm going to do an S for seconds to delay because every time I, every couple of seconds, it's updating it. So when I do this, it goes away <laughs> real quick. So you can see here I've got four disk controllers. So I've got a thread for each of the disk controllers that are within the VM. Uh, I've got uh, some general overhead, that's the VMX, MKS, mouse keyboard screen, a separate SVGA thread. Uh, I've, I'm cut off a little bit on the name field, so again, I can make that uh, a little bigger, make it 20 characters, still not quite enough. Let's make it 24, and there I can see the whole name of the field here uh, and see it, okay? Now, so now I can look at it and see how much of it is processor, 
here's my CPU. Dave, I've got a question for you. Don't mean to interrupt, but just in case someone else is wondering. You're using these L's and these E's and stuff like that. Are those common uh, things that you'll use, whether you're doing memory or CPU? Is that common between all of them? Most of them are. Uh, the the some of them are, are limited to CPU. I mean, the expand and, and limit commands really are uh, uh, well. Expand in particular is really more CPU because number of worlds there. But pretty much the rest of them are. Uh, as we go to uh, memory, for instance, notice it's still limited to that single VM. Uh, I don't see multiple worlds because the worlds really have to do with CPUs. So and uh, name fields and so forth we can mess with. So, yeah. So you can pick a target VM that you're limiting yeah. here and then switch between memory and disk and CPU and still stay on that VM and continue monitoring that one VM to try and figure out what a potential problem is. Exactly. CPU, uh, adapt, oh, that's, uh, let me yes. see, EU I think is, uh, no, it's not it. H is help. What am I looking for? Uh, VM disk little v, uh, and even that one's not uh, isn't quite working right. So I need to. Oops. I'm having a heck of a time with this keyboard. I may have to throw it away. There we go. And zero will unlimit it. And there's my VMs. But this one is. Uh, This one, the limit really doesn't work, you see. It's not actually doing what we'd expect. So, uh, actually getting rid of all of them. So, mostly I'm dealing with CPU at the moment. So, let's go back to CPU. All right, so there's my threads, my processors. Let me see, uh, five. Let me, uh, oh, to unexpand it. Hit the E again, grab the numbers, and that'll collapse it back in again. So it is a toggle. Uh, as it happens, uh, let me see, uh, five, I believe, is actually a, uh, let's expand five, VM, that one there. And you see it has two procs but only a single disk controller on it. And notice it's expanding it. I didn't limit it first, but it, the expand did work quite nicely. So that's worlds. Um, we'll come back and we'll put some load on these here in a little bit after we talk some more. So go ahead and take her back. OK, let me grab control again. All right. Thank you, Dave. So the next thing we're going to talk about, and Dave and I are going to kind of split up on these next few slides. Um, we're going to talk about support for multi-virtual CPU VMs, or SMP, symmetric multiprocessing. So as we mentioned before, it's the VM kernel's responsibility to schedule vir virtual CPUs to physical CPUs on your ESXi host. So the co-scheduling is optimized to run these multi-virtual CPUs VM officially. So co-scheduling, the technique for scheduling related processes to run on different physical processors at the same time. So the virtual CPU may be scheduled, descheduled, preemptive, or blocked while it's waiting for a certain event. So the CPU scheduler takes into account what we call SKU when it's uh, scheduling virtual CPUs in and out of the virtual machine. So SKU is the difference in execution rates between two or more virtual CPUs. As I mentioned before, all the virtual CPUs will start at the same time, but maybe one's doing more work than another. So the way I like to explain this is think of it like a race. And if we look at a race over here, everyone over here is our starting line, and all the virtual CPUs are here at the starting line. They've all got to be at the starting line at the same time. What's going to happen is this CPU is going to run out to a big lead. 
kind of like the Carolina Panthers. Then New York's going to catch up a little bit, and then, you know, now this guy can pull out a little bit more and finally win, and this guy's going to come up here, and this guy's going to come up there, and they're all going to go and fight. It's not going to, you know, if this guy wants to take off, it's going to not let it get too far ahead. So it's going to kind of keep everything all at the same distance or within a, a certain amount of distance, and that's the skew that they're talking about there. So the skew will increase when a virtual CPU is not making as much progress as one of its uh, other ones, which means it's going to slow it down, which means if we have one CPU that was going crazy but another one that's not, it's going to have to slow the VM down to kind of keep that skew in place. So, man, if we only had a single virtual CPU VM at that time, it could actually just take off and run. So a virtual CPU is considered to be skewed when its total or cumulative skew exceeds a given threshold that it calculates. So as we mentioned, VMware, there's two types of co-scheduling, strict co-scheduling and relaxed co-scheduling. With strict co-scheduling, those runners would all have to run at the exact same speed. With relaxed co-scheduling, it kind of lets one get ahead of the other and do a little bit more and things like that. Like it says here, cooperating threads or processes will frequently synchronize. Not executing them together concurrently would increase system latency. Well, think about if we had a multi-threaded application and it's running across four different threads, what would happen if one thread doing one thing for that application went crazy and got way ahead well, now the application's operating funny and certain things are going faster than others and now we got a blue screen because it's all out of whack. And that's what that helps to prevent. When we look at CPU resources, it is one of the most common causes of VMware performance issues. And there's lots of ways we can figure out that we're having a problem. Again, as I've mentioned before, I like to go easy first. So I go into Windows, if that's the operating system I'm running, I'll use task manager and resource monitor within there and be able to track, you know, what, what's going on over here? What am I seeing in common? Things like I see the CPUs are spiking like crazy. Okay, what's causing that? Well, and then from a VMware perspective, the first place I'll go in there is the performance statistics. So I can see the visual graph. Now, I like looking at the visual graph. It gives you a nice pretty little thing. But down at the bottom, you can then go in there and see the actual numbers that you're looking for. And there are numerous counters that you'll look at when you're going through those visual graphs. We then, from a command line putty session, we go to ESX top, visual ESX top, um, and from a predictive solution, we have vRealize operations, which used to be operations manager. Now, when we look at what metrics we want to monitor here, we want to look at a couple of things. Number one, we want to look at our virtual machine CPU usage, and then we want to look at our host CPU usage to see What's actually causing the limiting? Is it the VM or is it the host? So you have to look at both. And then we're going to look at CPU ready time, which we'll talk more about later. But that's a big, important counter when it comes to CPU that we'll want to look at. And we'll be able to actually show you some real-world values that we've run into. Now, here's the performance chart in the vSphere client. And you can see down at the bottom, it's showing you a couple of different things. You can see actual values off to the right here, which is what I like to use, these values right here. I don't like using the graphs as much. Some several things you want to look at over here. Number one, I can see that since we're monitoring CPU, each one of these is an actual physical core that we're looking at over here. You can see what value, what counter you're looking at, in this particular case, CPU ready. But what's really more important than that is the roll-up type that we're looking at here. Uh, whether it's a percentage or, in this particular case, it's a summation. And I'll have Dave explain the different ones there with the summation. And then you can see the units over here. Then we can see the, the latest, which is the current value, and minimum, maximum, and average values over here. So we can get all of that. Now, with ESX top, we're not going to see a summation value. We're going to see a percentage value. So we can go down here, and you'll see percentage CPU use, percentage run. Now, what's interesting here is when you look at uh, percentages, the way I was taught percentages is that percentages is a value of 100. 100% is everything. Less than 100% is partial. Now, what's interesting, though, is when you look at this and go, wow, ID number one is idle for 150%. The run is 225%. Well, Dave, can you explain how it's getting those numbers and what those mean to us here? 
Well, if you look at the number of worlds in that first row, it's got four worlds. So the total maximum is 400%. Ah, so it's 100% for each world times four. Very good. And Dave, can you explain the summation and what that means when it comes to CPU ready up there? Summations are looking at the graphs and, and seeing that summation ready time is a pain because it is the total amount in milliseconds of ready time during the time frame being displayed on the graph. Now when you're doing a real-time graph, what you're looking at is 20 millisecond time frames, okay? So each one of the data points is a, is a 20 second period. So you're seeing the amount of ready time that occurred in that 20 second period. CPU's at the top. There you go. All right, so each data point there is 20 seconds. But if you go to past day, that time is in is five minutes by default. If you go to past week, it's like uh, two hours. So the amount of ready time in two hours is could be a very huge number, but it still may not be significant. This is where really ESX top is very nice because it gives it to you in a percent, but you don't have any history. Here we're seeing ready time at 57 milliseconds in 20 seconds. Well, there's 20,000 milliseconds in 20 seconds. So that's nothing. It's, you know, ready time will never be zero, okay? Ready time, I love VMware's definition of ready time. It's the amount of time that the VM is ready. Thank you very much, VMware. Ready time is the amount of time it's sitting in a queue waiting for the waiting to be scheduled when it has work to do. It has something that needs to be done. An interrupt has occurred. Uh, maybe it's even been just interrupted. It's been stopped because you know it, it uh, ran out of its time slice. Whatever. There is work to do, and it's not doing it. That's ready time. All right. So it's not working. Idle time on the other time, or wait time, is time it's sitting in a queue when it doesn't have anything to do. So idle and wait are fine, ready time, big problem. And as I say, they're in milliseconds. If we were to go here and, and change the chart to, uh, to past uh, today, would you? Grab the past day. Okay. And same counters, fine. And there we go. Now we're seeing ready time. I'm not getting it per processor. We're having this little roll up. It actually didn't give him past day. It gave it past week. And but notice the milliseconds now is 2,439 for the host. Well, first of all, for this whole VM, well, this VM has three processors. So the first thing we got to do is divide by three to find out how much per processor it is. So that's 800 per processor. Then we got to take into account, okay, what is the time frame? Well, if over a past week, I believe it's two hours. So we got to divide it by two hours to figure out, you know, how much it is, how much is, that is as a percentage to find out if it's, if it's decent. Well. Two seconds out of two hours is nothing. Again, we're not seeing a problem here. Um, but it looks yeah. like a problem because it's really high up on the chart, so it looks like a problem to me. Man, it's showing 75%. Without understanding the summation times, it can really get very confusing. And it's, it, it's almost to the point where this graph is almost worthless when you're looking at CPU. You've got to do time. a lot of math. And, and you're looking at the far right. It's not at the milliseconds over there at the far right. That's not a percentage graph. It's a it's a millisecond graph. And at the far right, you see it says milliseconds, and there's where your scale is of what you're looking at. Right. But most people are going to look at this graph from the left and think, OK, <laughs> yep. it's, you know, 75% ready. This guy's horrible. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, definitely. So that can definitely cause a problem. Now, when we're when we're looking at ESX top or our ESX top, 
um, we're just going to use ESX top. Uh, one of the things you want to look at is physical CPUs used, and that's represented as a as a percentage value of the physical CPU core. Uh, we're then going to look at some other things, percent used, which is your utilization, uh, percent sys, which is your VM kernel system activity, your ready time. Now, this is actually a real-time counter uh, monitoring your CPU ready as a percentage value instead of a summation value. So this gives you a lot better information on ready times. And my explanation of, of CPU ready times is this. The CPU is ready to do work, but it's really ready and waiting because it has to wait for something for that to do. Um, and this is how I equate it to my students. Idle time is like when you're at unemployment. You have nothing to do. You're just hanging out. Whereas CPU ready time, you're at the DMV and you have everything else in the world to do, but you're waiting in line for these stupid people who aren't doing anything and you have to wait for other people. Same thing here. We have to wait for other VMs to run. So you don't want very high ready times. What would cause that would be too many VMs on a host and not really too many VMs, but too many virtual CPUs wanting to use the host simultaneously. Uh, percent wait time would be your wait and idling time. Your, your CSTP is your co-stop time. So that's your pending co-schedule. Uh, your MLM TD, so the time is not running because of CPU limits. And the, the NWLD is just the number of worlds that's been associated with that. And Dave's going to go more into that here in a little bit. Visual ESX top, this is again, as Dave mentioned before, it's a fling from VMware where you can get a visual representation of the data that you achieved from ESX top. And uh, Dave, one of these webinars, you need to go in and demo how to, how the, what that looks like. I don't know if we have time today, but one of the times. Here is a CPU ready counter, um, and that's the first thing you want to look at is the ready time. So I, I look at the, the first one that pops up on your screen is the percentage of the utilization, the CPU usage, either in megahertz or percentage. So that's the first one I see, and I look at that and say, wow, this guy's running at 80% utilization. Okay, well, 80% isn't bad if my ready times are low. 80% is bad if my ready times are high. So the one that really counts is looking at your ready times. But you may, like when that chart we looked at, looked like a really high chart, but it really wasn't bad because of what you're seeing through the performance within vCenter. So, again, the ready time, the amount of time a virtual CPU has to wait for the physical CPU to become available. Why is it waiting? Well, because the physical CPU is doing stuff for other people. So you are all, you're never going to get a zero value on that. Even if you had one VM running on a host that has 80 CPUs, you still won't have a zero value because it's going to have to go in and schedule it and deschedule it and wait times and things like that. It's still going to be above a zero value. Now over here, when we look at the number two warning side, you're looking at a high used value. So whether it's high host CPU or high virtual machine CPU, but that means it's actually working. Um, again, not a bad thing. I mean, if you got a SQL server that's pounding stuff out, it's going to have high CPU. That's what it does. That's not horrible. It's, it is what it is. Um, like it says up here, not always an indication of poor CPU performance. It's not a physical CPU but it may indicate high utilization, so which is a good thing. So Dave, let's go ahead and let's have you demo quite a bit in depth this time and uh, show some of the things you can do with the CPU. Yeah, I got some fun things I'm going to play with here. All right, yeah, let me make you a presenter. And, and, uh, there you go, you got it. And... That's the one. Here's my ESX top session again. Notice my used is very low, not a problem. Everything is great. I have no ready time is 1-2%, not a problem. Co-stop is zero over here on the right. Co-stop is time that it's waiting. Uh, well, let, let's back up a little bit. Co-scheduling, remember the SKU. So when one processor gets too far ahead of the others, it actually has to stop that one and let the others catch up. 
while it's stopped, it's got work to do, it's stopping it, that's co-stop. So that's lost productivity when that occurs, all right? Doesn't necessarily equate to ready time. Now, let's go in and look at a couple of things. One thing real cute here, this is a 2003 VM. I've got a little program here, it's a little VB script that I'm going to run. And I'll just open it up in a command prompt. Notice it's running 4 million calculations every 8 or 9 tenths of a second. Okay, if I look at my task scheduler, I've got a dual proc virtual machine. And notice my friends at, at Microsoft here don't run this single threaded app on one of the processors. It's bouncing back and forth between the processors. All right, and look what that, that's done over here. My ready time has climbed a little bit, uh, only getting 38% used. I really ought to be running 50. I'm getting some co-stop in here uh, a little bit. There, it's finally catching up. Got 95. Apparently, it just hadn't updated. There we go. 95. There's some overhead. Little co-stop going on. Got some ready time as it's waiting here. There is some overhead. I've got a dual proc host that this is running on. There's only two processors on it. One's running at 53, the other's running at 65 percent here. Physical CPU utilization. So I'm running 57 percent overall on the host. Okay, with this VM now getting up to 96 percent. All right, now let's go over here. I got another VM. This guy is a Windows 2008 virtual machine. And I'm going to do the same thing in it. In fact, first I'm going to shut this guy off. Okay, and then I'm going to run it over here. Open with a command prompt. And I'm doing 4 million calculations, not in 0.9 seconds, but in 0.5. I thought that was very interesting. 2008 and Windows 2012 are that much more efficient that they're running almost twice as fast as Windows 2003. Interesting, eh, what? And uh, let me see here. Help about, this is a 64-bit 2003 as well over here, okay? 64-bit, of course, 2008. So that's interesting. And again, I go back to my ESX top, and now I got a different VM, of course. It's running up here, hitting the up, force it to update. If you hit enter, it'll force it to update immediately uh, at any time. So there we're getting up to that 98. A little bit of co-stop, 2%. Getting some ready time as it's as it's translating that to uh, uh, dealing with the overhead and swap partially here because this work again this is a dual proc VM so it is bouncing it back and forth so a little bit of ready time as it schedules one processor then the other one then it has to schedule the other one and the other that's part of the reason for the co stop too is because it's bouncing that back and forth between the two. So let's get both processors busy. I'm going to run another one. Open with a command prompt. Now my look at my CPU inside the VM. I'm going up to 100%. I was running 50%. I'm running 100% inside the VM. Got both processors running single threaded apps. Bingo. Uh, get this thing updated 145 so far. Should get a little better than that. Let's see if we can get it on up. I keep updating it. Eh, we might not getting not quite getting to that 100, 200%, are we? My co stop, a little higher yet. Ready time, a little higher. I, I'm running a dual processor VM on a dual processor host. Think about it. I've got overhead. I've got three other VMs running. Four, five, six, seven percent. That's part of this ready time number here is the fact I've got these other VMs sitting out here running. I've got overhead. My kernel, of course, is running. And if I don't limit it by VM, I can see, hey, I, you know, I've got 
Uh, ESX Top is using 2%. <laughs> Host D is using 0.9. Uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.01, blah, 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 as we go on down here. So we have other overhead as well. So I'm getting some ready time. I've actually overloaded this guy a little bit. Okay. Now, I'm running 99% on both procs, running, running this host to death. All right. Now, what happens if I really overload it? I'm going to go back over here to the first one and crank up another one of these counters. Each one of these counters is trying to use 100% of a processor. So at this point, I'm running this guy. I'm running this one. Come on. And I'm running this one. So I'm running three processors worth of workload. And my time went from 0.5 seconds to 3, 2, <laughs> et cetera. This one's up 1.2, so they're all running about 1.2, 1 1.5. These two hosts, these two virtual machines, both have two processors. They both have the same share value. So VMware is trying to balance the load between these two virtual machines because it, the shares are prorated by the number of processors assigned to the VM. Okay, can't do that very well, but it's trying, even though one of the hosts is running at Two, process, two, two running, the other's running at just one process running. So, hmm, you're hitting about the same. They both have the same share, so it's trying to balance the load evenly between the two. Look what's happening to CoStop on the one that has, let's see, 36.5, that's the one that has two of them running. The CoStop is way high. I'm only running 76%. What the heck is going on? In fact, if I go out and look at the at the host, here's my vCenter, and I look at the host, go to the performance, and look at CPU percent of the host. When I had just that one VM running with two procs, I was hitting 100%. But look what's happening now. My host actual usage, total usage on the host is 75-78%. Yet I'm running three processors of load, but the host is only running 78%. This is because of the co-stop waiting for a processor because a co-stop to catch up is actually translating to idle time on the host. Now let's get things even, even, even up the load a little bit. I'm going to start a second one over here. And uh, let me go open with command prompt. Now I've got two VMs running two processes each on two processors. Let's see what happens to my load. It's going back up to 100%. Now my scheduler is being able to manage that time. I don't have, let me update this. My co-stop went back down. My ready time went up. It's no longer fighting with the co-stop, the co-scheduling of that processors bouncing around, instead it's just plain overloaded. It's ready time. So we can't just look at ready time in a vacuum. We can't look at usage in a vacuum. We've got to look at things like co-stop. If, if we had run, if uh, all these processes were single-threaded, let's, let's kill this guy. I've got another VM out here. And, uh, whoops, wrong, uh, wrong one. I want to go to the right vCenter here. And this guy 
is a has actually this one has two procs. Okay, four has one proc. There we go. So let's go up in here. We got a right-sized VM. When I only had one process running in that VM with two processors, I'm basically oversized on my VM, right? My VM is actually twice as big as it needs to be. So let's find one that's right-sized. I'm going to do the same thing here. Now I've got a single proc VM running one workload. I've still got my dual proc VM running two workloads. So everything is 100%. Everything is right sized. What's, what's happening over here on my host? Where's my vCenter? There we go. Back to my host. And what do you know? I'm still running 96, 100% CPU. I'm efficiently using the host. I'm still churning along nicely. And, oops, dropped it a little bit when I forced it to update. Idle's there. Co-stop, still chasing some co-stop. It hasn't quite balanced out yet. Let's see what's going on here. Yep, still got some co-stop on the dual proc VM. My ready time is high. Getting 84%, still chasing on the co-stop sum. That co-stop still translating to idle time on the host. The other one's running fine. It's, the ready time is there, but the co-stop isn't. That co-stop is, is, is a murderous thing because it's actually keeping the host itself from being fully utilized. Even with a dual proc, even with even loads, I'm not quite as high as I was before, but still nearly a half a half a proc of co-stop. I'm still losing some of that, some of the processing power of my host because I'm overloading the processors with co-stop, high ready times. I've got a very high ready time, but yet a low CPU usage. This is a big indicator of you know, overloading the host. Could be because of wrong sizing. This time I'm actually correctly sized, but I'm still seeing that co-stop occurring, as and the co-stop is relating back to idle time on the host. Let's see. what uh, We can see those same kind of things. Let's get back to... Uh, to here again, here's that co-stop is milliseconds in a real-time graph, so about half of a proc. Idle, almost as bad. Well, here's a legitimate idle. I mean, nothing was, didn't have anything running. 36,000 idle out of 40,000. Ready time, bouncing around, the least... Highest ready was when I had both of them, had four processes running, four of those, uh, those VB scripts running. So very interesting. Uh, when you get things overloaded, it can definitely cause problems. If uh, we look at, at ours, let me uh, pop this guy up. This is one of our hosts. Uh, let me see. I think that uh, yeah, was this one. I let me see what's going on on this one. Performance usage, not very high usage. Let's look at uh, ready time. co-stop, and I'm going to tell it just the host. This particular VM is a dual hexacore, so I don't want quite so many numbers. No co-stop, very healthy. 
get some ready time, but again, just say the ready time, uh, first you have to divide that number by the number of threads or, or cores or, or uh, logical processors according to where you're at. In this case, I'm looking at a host, so I'm looking at the number of logical processors. So I've got a dual hexacore that's 12 cores, 24 logical processors. So the first thing I'm going to do is divide that by 24, so a little over 200. So 200 per isn't that big of a number. So very healthy host. Um, I could cause a, an overload on it. I had an overload on this guy earlier because I had a bunch of these virtual ESX hosts on it. Dave, do you, quite a few can you go back and look at the statistics from that week when we overloaded it? I'm uh, not sure if I'm going to be able to get to those or not, to be honest. I'm not sure whether the roll-ups are, are working well enough to do that. I can look at usage. We've got some pretty high usage. I think that was about here. Was it on that host? Right. But I'm not getting the roll-ups on Ready and Co-Stop that far back. But what was interesting here is we accidentally scheduled too many VMs to run on the wrong host. It was supposed to go on our 80 logical processor host. Instead, it went on ours with 24. And we were seeing CPU ready times of 384,000 milliseconds, which is... Yeah, it was very, very ugly. Yeah, and I think a couple people were in that VMware class I was teaching at the time over in Phoenix, and uh, it was slow. I could probably generate some of that again here. Let me move some VMs around and kind of show you that what that did here. Let me get the host on here so I can find out which ones. And uh, let me see, that one's already on five, that one's on two, pick that one, that one, that one, whoops. Are you going to need to turn off DRS so it doesn't move them around? Uh, actually, I d won't have to. Dang it, i got to click in the right place, I'm getting some double clicking. Do, do, do. Oops, that was not on. Okay, we'll just move all of these over to that same five. That way we'll have a good dozen of them or so on five running. And you saw that he got the little warnings when he was doing a V-motion. That was because... Uh, it didn't detect guest OS heartbeats, and it's because these are virtual ESXi hosts, so we're not running VMware tools in them. And they're each with four procs each, so we've got a lot of procs contending for the resources on the host. And if I look at the cluster summary, I'm, I was very, very balanced earlier. Uh, and even with all these moved over there, uh, the... Uh, it uh, is going to run run it up a little bit, but it's still going to be pretty well balanced. You can see we're pretty well balanced across the load here. I did the distribution chart. So give it a couple of seconds here to move those guys. Now here's another thing you'll see as well. We've got 10 giggy networking, but see how long it's taken to vMotion these VMs? Because there are multiple virtual CPU VMs. It has to coordinate, because they don't have much memory in them, but it has to coordinate all the CPUs and, and going across your vMotions will take longer because they are multiple virtual CPU VMs. Yeah, they're starting to move a little better. They've got 10 gig each. They're yeah, not get, small. They've got 10 gig of RAM each. Well, they're not huge either. We've got one out here at 64 gig. It takes a little while sometimes to move. It's only got three procs. These have four. Yep. Are 
Are you seeing the this CPU is, counters go up yet? Yeah, here we go. You're seeing all 24 processors running across here and how much they're using. So we're using 34% on average. Here's all those VMs, these ESX VMs sitting here. They're finishing up. One of them's already done. Let's see if once they all get over there, we start seeing any post op. Getting some, a little bit of ready. Wouldn't surprise me if we see some coast op when this when these guys finish up. And last one is there. And yeah, we're not seeing coast up, but our ready time is coming up a little bit. But nobody's using percent. those ESX hosts either. They're sitting idle. So Yeah, there's no VMs running on them. Deliberately shut them all down except for 136. This is the one we've been playing with. And you can see it's using over a proc with the, the VMs running on it, 1.6. I'm running three loads on it right now. Not running 200% though. That's what's what I'm getting at, because it's not uh, because it's it's fighting for co-stop on those on those processors, waiting for the processors to be to be available. So we're actually doing pretty good. I'd have to load up some more VMs on there to, to actually force it now. I could fire up a few more. I'm still balanced. Even with all those VMs, I'm still balanced to load. I was, had this uh, set up the other day, and I had it, uh, it was still within a load. I had about 0.09, I think, uh, standard deviation of the balance. It still showed load balanced. But I was seeing some fairly hefty co-stop and, and, uh, and ready time here on 5.0 because of all the multiple processor VMs that were running on it. And its CPU utilization wasn't much higher than what it is right now, you know, 30% or so. And yet I was still seeing poor performance. In fact, that's what we were seeing during class the other day was a very poor performance, but yet the percentage utilization wasn't more than 30 or 40% on the hosts. But because it was fighting for those big four proc VM hosts, four proc virtual hosts running on the on the physical hosts, it was just uh, ugly. So the problem was didn't have high CPU utilization, which is the typically the first thing people look at. But the ready values were very high, and our solution was to move these two hosts that had more CPUs on them and once we did that the problems went away immediately so we could have assuming these were not very busy VMs we could have lowered them down to single CPU which would have solved the problem we could have put them on bigger hosts which is what we did so a couple of different things that you can do when you're in that scenario we got to balance out VMware only apparently only looks at the usage when they when DRS balances it doesn't look at ready time or co-stop so if you're out of balance on the number of virtual processors to physical processors you may have to do some manual balancing in order to get it to balance out right all right cool let me go ahead and take over and we'll finish this thing up Dave thank you yep All right, so as you can see with the analysis that Dave did, you can't always get, you can't look at one value like percentage usage and say, boom, this is my problem. Sometimes you can, but uh, a lot of times you have to go d deeper in depth and look at some of those other counters, which is pretty interesting. And you, a lot of times you're going to have to use that ESX top, which is great. So this is part three. Uh, again, we will get this uploaded to YouTube as soon as we get a chance. And on uh, Wednesday, we'll have part four, which will be memory analysis, um, followed up by part five with uh, networking. So for those of you interested, again, as mentioned, we do have a class that's built around uh, the examination, the VCAP prep, 
as well as advanced admins for those of you interested in, in learning more about this and really getting in depth on some of this stuff. As we mentioned before, we're going to have a $50 giveaway. Uh, we're thinking about actually right at the end of the class on the 29th after we stop the recording uh, doing that giveaway then. But contact us for any information about upcoming classes, maybe you need a performance analysis, sign up for any upcoming webinars we might have. And you know, any problems you have, just give us the, uh, 